I invite you to turn now in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We will be considering the first four verses this morning. Despite being spread out across the valley and depending where you're watching this, perhaps the country or the world, Christians possess God's own testimony of life's most pressing issues. We have in our Bibles a record of God's thoughts about his son, Jesus, as well as salvation and what one must do to be saved. This passage in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, this tells us what God thinks about Jesus. And so we turn our attention here now to consider again what God thinks about his son. Look at verse 1 with me. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. It is difficult to find a more succinct, more Christ-exalting section of Scripture than what we find in the book of Hebrews. For 13 chapters, the writer articulates that Jesus, the Son of God, the pinnacle of God's revelation and the one about whom the Old Testament prophets wrote, he has finally come. This writer articulates that Jesus has come. He came to suffer and save God's people, and he will come again to establish his kingdom. In these opening verses, in order to prevent apostasy in his hearers, this writer, with many words, reminds us of the greatness of the one through whom God has spoken. He says in verse 1 that God has spoken. And in verse 2, that God has spoken. He has spoken in these last days. He has spoken to us. And most importantly, he has spoken in his son. Formerly, God spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. But now... God has spoken in this one, Jesus, his own son. And since this is the case, we had better listen carefully to what God says about his great son through whom he's spoken. In these few verses, who is Jesus? According to these verses, Jesus is the final spokesman for God, the heir appointed by God, the uncreated creator with God. He is the glory of God made visible, an exact imprint of God's nature. Jesus is the universe's sustainer, a perpetual priest before God. He is supremely honored by God. He is superior in his person and in his name to all angels. Jesus is the son of God. Right now, we have so many things vying for our attention. Circumstances and confidences and things in which we sought security a couple months ago have been abruptly stripped away from us. And what used to seem like reliable, strong towers, things like job security, earning potential, freedom to move about and go as we pleased, frequent fellowship with others, good health, these things have all, praise God, 
proven to be inadequate, faltering sources of comfort. But here in Hebrews chapter 1, we find unchanging, certain, unshakable comfort for the soul. These words are the testimony of God concerning his own son. I want to draw our attention especially to the second half of verse 3, which says, When he, Jesus, this son, had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is God's son. No one else bears such a unique title as this. There are many sons of God, sons and daughters of God, yet only one can rightly claim the title of the son of God. Again, what it means that Jesus is the son of God is that Jesus, according to verse two, owns everything, absolutely everything. He manifests the glory or inherent weightiness within God himself. And what it means for him to be God's son is that he is the exact representation of God's very nature. That is, everything that God is, divine, sovereign, just, merciful, gracious, immutable, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, abounding in love and faithfulness, patient, wise, etc. All of these things that God is, Jesus, God's son, is as well. And just to further make the point from this same section, what it means for Jesus to be God's son so that there is no confusion, drop down to verse Six, the author says here in verse six, when he again brings the firstborn, that is his son, into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. So what it means for God to be, or God's son, Jesus, to be the son of God, is that he is worthy of all worship. In verse eight of the son, God says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And then in verse 9, the second half of verse 9, God says, Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And then finally in verse 10, God the Father goes on to say, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. What it means for Jesus to be the son of God is that he is worthy of all worship, verse six. He is God, verse eight. Again, verse nine, he is God. And then in verse 10, he is called Lord by God the Father. It it could not be clearer from these verses that Jesus is God. He is equal with God the Father, equally deserving of all worship. God the Father calls his son God. And this God, God the Son, verse 3 says, made purification for sins. This harkens back to the role of the Levitical priests in the Old Testament who would offer sacrifices on behalf of the people before God in order to cleanse those people of the guilt that they had incurred by sinning. And here, Jesus, God's son, is said to have accomplished this and then afterward taken his rightful seat, the highest honored position possible at God's right hand. This implies a resurrection since he offered himself as the sacrifice for sin. How did he purify his people? Through making purification for sins. Again, in the, in the near context, chapter 2, verse 9, reminds us of this. Who do we see? Well, we see him who was made lower, who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, is who we're talking about, because of the suffering of death, 
now crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus made purification for sins. He purified God's people of the guilt that they had incurred because of their sins. By suffering unto death, chapter 2, verse 9 says, and now after suffering unto death, he is, can be seen crowned with glory and honor, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, as we just read. Jesus did not offer the same thing as the Old Testament priest. He didn't bring the blood of animals. This priest, God's own son, when he came to function as a priest before God on behalf of God's people, he offered up himself. He gave his own blood in the place of those who would draw near to God in faith by believing God's own testimony concerning his son. Jesus tasted death for you, Christian, and that is cause to rejoice. He tasted death for you. You can trust God. If you have already trusted Jesus with your eternal destiny, then what is trusting Jesus with what you may per perceive as government overreach? If you have already trusted Jesus with your eternal destiny, then you can trust God with job loss or loss of health or even something as loss of life. This is why these truths are comforting words for us. So draw near to God, draw near to Christ in faith in the coming days, remembering that you have a great high priest who is the son of God, Jesus, God in the flesh. Now, finally, we've seen our online numbers, view, uh, viewing numbers increase beyond the members and regular attenders of Grace Bible. We praise God for that. That means that God has carried the ministry of the word from this church beyond where we could think or uh, bring it ourselves. But knowing that, I would be remiss not to address you who may be watching who have not yet believed these truths about Jesus, who have not yet embraced Jesus as God himself. What we just read in these few verses, and I would encourage, encourage anyone watching, finish the book. There's much more to be said. But these words are not the, the words describing Jesus, who is worshiped perhaps by Jehovah's Witnesses, who is one God among many. No, he is the God, God the Son. This is not the Jesus who is worshiped by Mormons, who is, again, one God among many, slightly below God himself. He is the God, the uncreated creator, as we read in verse 3. This is not the God of Catholics, the, the Christ of Catholics, whose atonement is insufficient and needs to be made every single mass. This priest offered himself once and then took his seat. No more to be offered again. No more to be offered for sin. And so if you have not believed these truths, then how gracious of God that you are actually hearing these truths now. Please repent. You can know Jesus as your God and Lord and Savior who endured God's judgment against your sin on your behalf today. This doesn't require any magic words or any special prayer. It only requires a humbling of yourself to embrace what we just read. It requires that you abandon, abandon every good thought that you might have about yourself and what you can accomplish before God on your own merit, by your own good works. This requires that you instead agree with God's assessment of you, that you are a sinner who is so utterly sinful, so completely helpless <laughs> 
that the uncreated creator and sustainer of the universe, Jesus, God's own son, had to offer himself on your behalf. He, that one, had to die in your place. Trust what God says about his son. He is worthy of your trust. And no one who has ever put their complete trust in him has been ashamed, has been disappointed. Please trust him today.